Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I am so excited to welcome you to an excellent conversation tonight between Sarah Stein Greenberg and Liz Gerber. Thanks for coming along. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, social justice, and education, among others. We have over 150 videos of past events archived on our website and our YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. Now, for over a decade, Executive Director Sarah Stein Greenberg has helped lead the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, otherwise known as the D School, an interdisciplinary institute at Stanford University that nurtures creative thinkers and doers and helps spread the methods of design. She is the author of this brand new book, which I love, called Creative Acts for Curious People, How to Think, Create, and Lead in Unconventional Ways. She has taught the D School's foundational class, Design Thinking Bootcamp, an experimental course called Design Thinking for Public Policy Innovators, and the long-running high-impact entrepreneurial design for extreme affordability, whose students have gone on to design products and services that have helped over 100 million people worldwide. She'll be joined by Liz Gerber, who's a longtime friend of fans. We hosted her for events in 2013 and in 2016. She is a professor at Northwestern University, co-director of Northwestern Center for Human Computer Interaction and Design, and faculty founder of Design for America, a national network of interdisciplinary students who work together to solve problems they care about in their community. As a young grad Stanford graduate student, Professor Gerber co-founded the Design and Business Initiative at Stanford's D School, created by David Kelly. But Professor Gerber has also served as an innovation strategist, executive advisor, leadership coach, and innovation trainer for several of the world's premier organizations, including Fortune Global 500 Corporations, philanthropic and humanitarian organizations, and educational institutions, and FAN. So now let's welcome Sarah Stein Greenberg and Liz Gerber. Wow. Thank you, Lonnie. That was, um, that was touching. And thank you, Sarah, for coming. How exciting for you to be here. It's such a special, special evening for us. Um, I'm really excited. It's great to be here. Thank you. I want to go back to 2005 and just have a flashback. Remember when we met each other and have a confession for you. I found you deeply inspiring. You were one of the first business school students at the Stanford D School. And while many of your classmates were kind of sitting back a little distant, you were right in there. I think you were working on a pump, a water pump. And it was just watching your inspiration and transformation in real time was such an honor. And what a special thing it is for us to be here celebrating the work that you've done uh, with all of your wonderful colleagues since. So thanks for, thanks for being that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that flashback. You actually just, you evoked so many other memories of that, that really <laughs> special time. It was a special time. Um, so back to the, back to the present. Um, one thing I love about your book and the way somebody asked me how I described it, I said, well, here's how I'm going to describe it. What Sarah did is I think about creativity as like a cave, a big dark cave, really hard to navigate. And what you've done is you've gathered together 80 different types of lighting flashlight, candle, flamethrower, you name it, from all the people with whom you've worked and you've brightened up the cave and you've, like, you've just illuminated this awesome opportunity to really tap into our creative potential. So what a gift to the world, thank you. My first question, um, your book opens with this awesome story about uh, students using their creativity um, to work in Bangladesh, India um, on, a, on a hospital related project. And I couldn't help but think, what, tell me more about that story and how is the approach they took unique um, to other ways of, of thinking and problem solving? Well, that is such a good place to start because I think, um, you know, when many people hear design, 
for some of us, it evokes like interior design. What should the furniture look like? How should I create a space or the design of, you know, physical objects only, yeah. right? And, and those things are really an important part of design, but it, design has also evolved very rapidly to yeah. be about services and experiences and data and technology and encompass this just much wider array of what can you be intentional about creating? Yeah. So the story that I opened the book with is a story of four students who were in um, one of our classes designed for extreme affordability. And they were an interesting mix. So right off the bat, there were two medical students and a public policy student and a civil engineer. So yeah. they had kind of, you know, not necessarily the group of skills that you would imagine on a on a design project, right? Yeah, also and, I imagine totally different languages, right? I mean, yes, just yes. vocabulary, totally different. Yes, and actually, I mean, for me, that's one of those things that that's that's part of what we're trying to do when we're like turning on those flashlights and candles and the lighting <laughs> in the cave is like, what is a language we can all use to collaborate in more creative ways on the kinds of on the kinds of problems that are really important. So this group of four students were partnered with a hospital in southern India, and um, the hospital's mission is really about delivering extremely high quality uh, healthcare, but at very low cost and at broad scale. And that is those are three elements that don't always go together, right? And so the students really walked into the situation thinking, okay, we, we're here to help and we think we could be designing something that makes this more affordable or more efficient and thinking about patient flow and thinking about what can you design for the clinicians or for the hospital administrators. And when they um, arrived to do some site visits and start to actually interview people and observe what was going on, they noticed something that they hadn't expected to see. And what they noticed is that there were many people in the hospital that were waiting they were waiting in the waiting rooms, but they were also waiting in the hallways. They were waiting kind of in any, any available space. Mm -hmm. And as they started to connect with some of these individuals, they realized these are family members of the people who are in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And actually they're quite stressed out and anxious. They don't have a lot of information about what's going on. They don't have a lot of um, insight into like what's gonna what's the trajectory for their their loved one. Um, how might they you know what what do they need to do when they bring this person home from the hospital? And so this that was one of the things that the students really observed. And I think in in large part because it was such an emotional set of needs, they they like really honed in on this deep um, suffering in a lot of cases that the family members were going through. And they came, came away with this idea of like, well, maybe it's not about the hospital administrator. Maybe we're looking in the wrong place. Maybe we should be thinking about how could we serve the needs of this population that's kind of not considered to be normally part of the healthcare picture. So they did a lot of experimentation. They created some um, prototypes that at first they were kind of almost embarrassed about sharing. And then they finally shared them with their partner. Wait, and pause they for a some, moment. What's a prototype? So in this case, um, they had this idea about activating the family members, right? And so they, they knew that they wanted to figure out, could we impart some basic healthcare education and some skills to people so that when they take their family member home, they're in really good hands. And so they, they did these like dramatic skits and filmed them. Um, and, and that's a prototype. They, and that was a prototype, right? And it was a prototype okay. because it embodied, it was a, they created an experience that someone could react to. Okay. Someone could test for them and give them feedback. Yeah. So they did these videos of like what it, what the dramatic, you know, representation of like taking someone's pulse or, you know, testing how well they're doing in terms of the air capacity in their lungs after surgery. And they sent them off to their partner and they were nervous and they, they got this amazing feedback of like, oh, these are kind of interesting. Like, let's, let's keep going in this direction. People had a good response. So over the summer, they went back, they, they actually piloted the, the approach and now several years later, they have um, launched this incredible organization called Nura Health. And they, they are basically in the business of activating nurses and other clinicians to provide training to family members while they're waiting. And the incredible thing is that this is a very low cost approach, but it dramatically reduces the rate of hospital readmissions and post-surgical complications. And it's because all of a sudden the person who has like the deep most vested interest in caring for someone who's sick is now equipped with some of the important basic, you know, healthcare skills around hygiene, around watching for the warning signs when someone's returning home after surgery, 
So it, this incredible example of how when you are open to different directions emerging in your design work, sometimes you spot an opportunity that no one could have imagined. No, but we could not have sent those students into that situation with that sense, you know, with that sense of like, oh, here's where you should look. It was really what they uncovered when they arrived. So that is the kind of um, trajectory that we hope for. That's the kind of um, skill development we're aiming for. That permission, to, one, that you walk into a new situation with permission to really explore what's here. What, what, do, what do I see? What do I observe? And what do I think is a problem that might need to be solved, regardless of whether the faculty have said anything about that. And, and then to really experiment their way towards a solution that nobody has thought of before. That's awesome. Thanks for giving that very detailed example. And it really illuminates what these kind of creative practices can do. Um, but I want to get practical for a moment. I'm a parent um, and my kid does not like to write thank you letters to his grandparents. What, help me. What do I do? And where can this, can I apply this to everything? But you know, that, that's really, you don't really have to have me solve that problem. Although it is a real problem, but I, I can imagine it's a real problem. I mean, in that, <laughs> in that case, like I, I would want to, I would want to interview your kid, right? I want to understand like, what is it actually that is, you know, stopping that, right? And I might even like try to visualize that data that I'm getting from, I'm trying to, I'm trying to de decide which child of yours do I think that might be. Um, so like you, you actually, first you want to go and understand the problem better. So you might have a hunch as the parent, what the, what the deal is. I might approach that with totally fresh eyes and like ask some really naive questions that actually gets at something that is that is blocking that process, right? Maybe they're you know annoyed with you. Maybe they're you know <gasps> no. not so. I mean, I, I would. I mean, I, that's <laughs> obviously the least likely situation. Um, you know, maybe they're like don't quite understand what it feels like to get an amazing letter from someone that's thanking them for you know. So like I could imagine you know different different um, opportunities would arise even just from that from that small example. And and then we would build some prototypes, we would test out our ideas, we'd come up with a lot of ideas, we'd discard a lot of them, but we'd pursue a few, um, and we would see what happens. Awesome. Thank you. Already got ideas. I'm going to go do that right after this. So um, it sounds like there's nothing you can apply. Or actually, let me ask you, is there anything that you can't apply this process to? Like, should I use this when doing open heart surgery? Yeah, I'm not a fan of of what someone might call like surgery thinking. Like you want to actually have like a whole a whole rigor and, and a bunch of skills behind that. I think where this these kinds of approaches are incredibly important is when it's not there's not a clear answer for what the solution might be, right? So I actually think like if you're doing something where there's a lot of data and evidence that if you do it in this way, it's going to have a better outcome than if you do it in that way. Sur heart surgery is definitely in that category. Um, then, then you actually want to stick with a tried and true approach. When you're in a moment, like which frankly all of us are now in constantly, where you're faced with a set of challenges, where actually a new way of approaching it might be useful, yeah. coming at it with fresh eyes, um, not assuming that the, the sort of conventional approaches are going to work, that is exactly when you want to use these more creative approaches. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And then speaking of limits, um, I'm always surprised every day. I always have college students telling me I'm not creative. I'm not creative. And I'm sure there's people like listening in who say, oh yeah, I, I know those people. Um, do you believe that actually everybody can be taught or strengthen their muscle of creativity? And what are, I, what are the limits? Yeah, Anything I mean, I, teach? <laughs> I, I fun, is there anyone I can't teach? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit on that one for a minute. <laughs> I think what I would say is like, I, I, I think it's part of the human condition fundamentally to be creative okay. uh, even in, in the broadest sense of creativity, right? Which is like being resourceful and okay. solving problems when you see them around you okay. um, and, and just being, being inventive. Like, oh, you don't yeah. like how such and such is working? Like, oh, try, you know, change how you're approaching it, right? That's, that is creative problem solving. I think we have so many myths in our culture yeah. that are around like, who is creative and who is not creative. And, you know, the, the sort of like the standard one is like, well, I can't draw, so I'm not creative. Well, that's preposterous. Like a lot of, you know, concert pianists can't draw either, but they are, you know, it's like, so there's just like, there's so many ways. Now I can't be, a, I'm not a concert pianist, but I'm definitely creative, right? I'm, I, I create, you know, extremely, um, 
uh, intentionally designed interactions for students to shift behavior. I think about you know, how my team is operating and think about how I can build a more creative approach to get the kinds of outcomes or shifts that I want. And, and you know, just those small examples, like I, I absolutely think creativity can show up in any kind of context. And I think every single person that I've encountered so far has that within them. Every age, what about every age? Is there an age limit? It's like past a certain every age, age, you're done. Well, actually there's some, there's some research about like the, that as you um, get older, creative behaviors are one of those things that actually like keeps you nimble and keeps your brain working really well. Um, and that in, in some, some people report that their creativity uh, increases with age, partly because they have a broader repository of ideas that are kind of like mushing around from their longer experience to draw from. And there's so much about creativity that's about making like unexpected connections between things that already exist. It's, it's not like the, another myth. It's not about just like creating something that has never existed in the world before. So often about recombining and remixing. And so there is, there's actually really interesting evidence about like older people have more to draw from, right? Yeah. But, I also imagine maybe, maybe less inhibition. You know, the, I think that's a, I, I love to see a study on that. Actually, I don't, that's, know. I don't I, know. That would be so interesting. I, I think that in, I, I wonder also if there's like a point at which you perhaps retire from a more, you know, like a corporate environment or a more restrictive environment, and then you lose those inhibitions and start to be able to, to flourish in that way. I will say that like that middle zone for folks who are in an environment where there's a lot of routine, there's a lot of constraints, there's a lot of sort of more rigid approaches and norms, that can be an inhibitor. And so I do often find that like really young students are totally uninhibited and have a lot to offer. Our students, you know, your students, students sort of at the college and grad school age, they've got some behaviors already that they need to unlearn. And then adults, it's like, if you can get it, if you can get it, like there's so much there in terms of the, the, the creativity that's possible, but there's a lot of unlearning that has to go into that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard job you've taken on. <laughs> thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, thank you. So all ages, all many different applications. Um, thank you. That's very helpful. Another theme that comes up in your book a lot that I just absolutely love is near and dear to my heart is the theme of collaboration. So it's not just the individual, as you said, that lone, the myth of the individual with flash, flash, flash bulb above their head. Um, and you offer a really interesting exercise that I'm wondering if you can share. It's by our dear friends, um, Patricia Ryan and Dan Klein, which focuses on how we respond to collaborators. So it's not just enough for two different people to be working together, but really how we think about um, elevating them and not just pointing out what's wrong about what they do, but actually, making their ideas better than they were. So I'm wondering if you can tell me how you think about collaboration and in particular collaborative creativity, how we work with others to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's so much about creativity if you're working in a group where you are, you actually have to listen in new ways. And yeah. then you're like the way in which you respond and receive someone else's ideas has so much to do with whether they then offer you their next idea, right? And there's, there's this incredible um, uh, sort of escalation of sort of interesting ideas that happens like when you actually hold that space for someone else to, to feel the trust that is required to like get their kind of half-baked ideas out in, into the world. So, and actually Dan, um, who contributed uh, a couple of assignments in the book, he, he really gave me this great insight one day, which is like, in his experience, so much team conflict comes from when one person is in the mode of exploring and another is in the mode of deciding. I don't understand and what you're talking about. Sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't fair. Thank you for that clear demonstration. I was like, <laughs> she doesn't understand. Whoa, I must not be doing a very good job. I don't know if I should say anything else, right? So yeah, like it's, it's, it's powerful actually. Psychologically, yeah, when, sorry, someone, hear you. when someone sort of says like, no, right? The no, but is really, is really a, a dismissive way to kind of stop someone in their tracks. So even just practicing that, the difference between like, yes, and, or no, but, and getting that sort of real sense in your, in your bones of like, what happens for me when I hear that, those different words and what happens to, to the other people that I'm working with. So one of the assignments in the book is all about how do you actually play with that language and respond and like build up a story that I either you know, uses that sort of no but or a yes and kind of mentality. And, and that, but that, that core insight about 
the, the different disposition of somebody who's exploring versus someone who's, who's deciding, like that is one of those incredibly powerful, like that's an invisible dynamic until you name it. And then you're like, wow, that just accounts for so many moments of tension that you've experienced in any meeting, in any collaboration. And so what we try to do at the D school is like, we want students to be, or, or anyone to be able to name what's going on. Yeah. So it's like, if you're in the part of your design work where you're trying to explore a lot of different ideas, or you're, or you're saying like, we saw this need, we saw that need, we saw that need, let's actually put them all on the table. Yeah. You wanna be able to name what's going on. And if you're in the moment where you're like, hey, we need to evaluate and decide which of these, you know, which three ideas we're gonna to advance to the kind of next stage, then you wanna be able to name that that's what's going on. So that vocabulary that you were talking about, like across those four different students, that's part of what we're trying to offer is to build up people's understanding of like, oh, I'm in this moment of the creative work or yeah. I'm in that moment and we're all here together. We're all located in the same moment. We're speaking the same language so that we can actually collaborate with the minimum friction. I love that. It reminded me as you were talking of the on air button they have when somebody's on the radio, it's like, are we on, or are we off? Like, where are we? And you're right, yeah. it's, so, it's not something we often articulate, but it's, it's going on and it absolutely, I, yeah, I heard, I, I remember um, one team actually created, uh, they, they put um, the words flaring or focusing or diverging or converging on opposite sides of like a piece of cardboard that had been, uh, you know, cut out as a, as a triangle. Um, so like, are you, are you opening the aperture? Are you flaring or are you focusing? Right. Yeah. And they literally would flip it around as a reminder to the whole team, a visible symbol of like, okay, we're moving into that other mode. Right. And, yeah. and I love, I love that use of like the physical artifact that, I mean, you could make with any materials that you have around to right. name and, and identify and align around where you are in the creative work. I love that. But what if you just want to make sure everybody knows you're super smart? It's just really lovely to put down other people's ideas and um, demonstrate just how great you are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is a that's a tough dynamic. I can't I can't even laugh about that. It's that's really Sorry. hard. I mean, what? <laughs> well, I will laugh about that with you. You know, I actually th I think I'll I'll just say like I think that's a real thing that a lot of a lot of folks encounter. Yeah. And one one sort of way to handle that is actually to ask people to write down like so in a, in an ideation session in particular where you're asking everybody to offer ideas, mm -hmm. have people write those down ahead of time. So that everybody gets their sort of moment of being like, well, like I got to my whole list, right? Like I read, you know, it's like, and I get, I got to say all of them and you can figure out, do you want it, people to go around do you, but then you start the real brainstorm or the real ideation session yeah. where you're actually actively getting people to build off of the ideas that are coming out in the moment. And so I think there's a way you can kind of like allow for that very human need to be sort of like seen and recognized for your own ideas, but then put the emphasis on the interaction because yeah. it's, it's where it's, that's where the new stuff is going to come from. It's like you say something and then I build on it. And then something new actually is, is created from that. Yeah. One of the techniques I like to do is um, be super explicit about, about why everyone's there and what they have to contribute. So it's like, like almost build up their ego at the beginning. So we all know we're all great established. Now let's begin. So the ego, we don't have to worry as much about the ego going in. Um, I like I that. that. Thank you for that technique. So now I'm going to get to another tough, tough topic, which is let's be honest, when we're all together, rarely are the, are we equal power with the person um, that we're generating ideas with? And I think one of the things people might find surprising in your book is the discussion and the recognition that power dynamics influence and relate to creativity. So love to have you uh, share your thoughts and how power dynamics influence creativity and maybe some tips and tricks that you, you recommend for uh, dealing with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll give two specific examples from the book. So that, you know, power dynamics can really affect your team, right? And it's in kind of in the way that we were just describing. And that can be, you know, from sort of like the different uh, hats that people wear in society, that could be about culture, that could be about gender, that could, you know, all of those, those hierarchies that like filter into to how we interact with each other and how we treat each other. Um, and there are, there are a lot of practices around d disarming some of that. Um, one that I love is actually, it is about like introducing some randomness 
And so, so there's a there's a really interesting assignment um, that came from uh, a designer named Hannah Jones that's called by association. And by association is basically like in the middle of a brainstorming session, you, you take a pause, you take all the ideas down off the wall, you reshuffle them, you have two people take you know, each take a pile and they pair up and whatever is their idea from from those uh, sticky notes that's on top of the pile, they have to make a new idea out of that those first two. And because there's no judgment being applied to like which two are being paired, it just completely, it's like, it's not the person who wrote the best post-it or made the best drawing or said it the loudest. It's just treat, it's really leveling it, right? And that's a way to kind of just like interrupt some of those, those power dynamics that can, that can be in the room, even if you're trying really hard to, to submerge them. And I actually think there, I mean, there's a long history in, in the, in, in lots of creative fields around using a little bit of randomness to kind of like get past your own mental blocks oh, um, or, or kind of challenge some of those just normal ways of human behavior. So I really like that one. And then another way that power dynamics can certainly show up, power dynamics and bias and all of those things can certainly show up is in your actual design work, right? It's like yeah, the things that, 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 you know, it's like what you're carrying into, into um, the work can, can manifest, right? Even unconsciously. So there's a wonderful assignment um, by a Chicago-based designer um, named Chris Rudd. Thank uh, you. I was going to bring him up. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> who it's a, a great assignment that is called um, Identify, Acknowledge, Challenge. Yeah. And it is a structured way to sit down with your team and figure out, okay, like what are the assumptions that we know, the stereotypes that we know are floating out there in our society, in our culture about the particular people that we're working with or who we're trying to serve and like really naming them. And then thinking about like where, where there's um, uh, an overweighting of positive or negative stereotypes and then figuring out like, okay, how do we address this directly in our work, right? How do we actually, des whatever it is that we're designing, whether we're providing college counseling services, whether we're designing a healthcare experience or, or a product, like really making sure that you're not pretending that bias doesn't exist, but you're, you're naming it and you're, you're bringing it, you're squarely examining it in the context of your design work. Right. Um, and, and probably and that, recognizing that like, even if you recognize it, there's still probably underlying bias that you haven't. Ignored. There's underlying, there's, you're still going to have, you're still going to have um, areas that you're, that you're probably overlooking. And I think that that also gets to then another area around power dynamics in design, really for anybody who makes anything, right? Whether you're in technology, whether you're an engineer, whether you're a designer, whether you're a leader, you are um, in some cases like you you have a power advantage over the people who you might be designing for, right? Yeah. And yeah. so like and, and often that's because like you're seen as the expert or you're coming at you're being you know sort of like brought in to help solve a problem that that mm -hmm. has you know really been um, challenging a community. And so that's another type of power dynamic that can come up where you you yeah. really really have to figure out. How do you activate the community as a part, you know, really in integrated into the design work to make sure that the assumptions that you might carry as an outsider or as somebody who has higher status does again does not affect the the long term impact negatively of the of the work that you're doing. Lovely, you took me exactly where I wanted to go, which was the role of humility in design, and you highlight an exercise or an assignment by Susie Wise. Um, that helps us understand, I think she calls it the ride along. Um, and I'm wondering if you can explain what that is. I think it's just such a beautiful example of, of how we bring humility to the creative process. Yeah, so she, um, uh, she was working with a group of students who were uh, design students at Stanford and a group of community members in Oakland mm -hmm. um, on one of the many courses that she's taught at the design school, um, the D school. And she uh, came up with this brilliant idea about asking people to arrive together at a particular workshop across that difference on public transportation. And in particular, the reason that she was doing that is because the folks who were part of the Oakland community were actually familiar with, very knowledgeable about like 
how to navigate their city. And the students who were coming from a different part of the Bay Area had, had no idea. So it created a different paradigm of who was the expert in that moment. Then there's also something very human about like sitting next to somebody on a bus where you are, you are peers, you are sitting literally next side by side, shoulder to shoulder with someone. And she left it very unstructured in terms of like, what should you talk about? What's the interaction? Because they were about to arrive then at a very structured design, you know, design workshop. And I, I just, I thought that was so brilliant as a way to really challenge some of those normal power, power dynamics and to, to reposition people as they're coming in to do this collaborative work in a really different way. Yeah, thank you. I, I was really moved by that when I read about it. Um, so now we've kind of talked about, we've just gone from humility. I wanna get deep into feelings now. Some people may be surprised that feelings are a big part of creativity. And in fact, in your post um, in, the, in Fast Company a couple of days ago, you referenced Nicole Kahn's um, trough of despair, I believe is what you described it. Can you explain what is the role of feelings in creativity and what is this trough of despair that we should look forward to, I think is your conclusion. That is my conclusion, but it took me a while to get there. So I'll, so I'll just say, so I, I, I really, when, when I was a student, I experienced this moment where actually I was working on that pump project that you, that you mentioned before. And, um, I just experienced this moment, like a few weeks before the, the final deadline where I just was like, we're not getting anywhere. Like, this is, this is terrible. I can't, I'm embarrassed to show it in the, in the design review. Like I just, I, I was really filled with all of this self-doubt. And I just could see all of the ways in which it didn't feel adequate. I mean, we were trying to help farmers who have small plot farms in emerging markets have a, a less expensive way to pump water and irrigate their fields. And like, so that was like a challenge that really mattered. And I just was like, I just don't know if we're getting there. And what Nicole explained to me is she was like, first of all, you are onto something. Here's what's great, but here's, you know, what's not working. Here's some feedback. Yeah. She like helped me actually get into the kind of merit of where we were in the project. But she also just said every single design project I've ever worked on, I right like, usually right before the end of it, I, I, I can only see the flaws. I can see all the nicks in the metal. I can see the, you know, she, she really named that this trough of despair is something that most people who do any kind of creative work experience. And it, and that just struck me as, as very powerful. Well, as you know, already, I like naming things and sort of like getting them, like making them less mysterious by, by naming them. Um, but it, but so it turns out that like, there's this moment when you're when you're experiencing that where you actually that's an intense moment of learning, right? That's actually the moment where you're stretching beyond your pre-existing abilities, where you're you're doing something that's just a little bit harder than what you've done before, and that's part of why you're feeling insecure about it, about like where you are and whether that work is going to measure up. And so there there is actually a, a name for that that I've borrowed from mathematics education, which is called productive struggle. And productive struggle literally means it, it's like when, when you're learning math, if you struggle at first with the concepts, you are much more likely to retain them and to be able to transfer those skills to other kinds of math problems. And that I think is true as well in design, where it's like, if you're struggling, you often feel if you're, you're at your emotional lowest, but you're actually learning so much. You're learning about the problem. You're learning about your own abilities. So what I'm trying to do in, in this book is to say, that, that feeling doesn't feel great, but you no. should expect it. It's like, it's not like a, aha, I'm struggling. It's like, I'm really struggling. But if you pay attention to that, you'll notice that often that comes right before the big breakthrough. Interesting. And, and that breakthrough is what you're going for. So if you can learn to tolerate those ups and downs and actually really understand that is a part of the process of stretching yourself to work on something harder and harder and more ambitious, that is an important reframe to be thinking about as you're, as you're, you know, kind of building your fortitude to tackle really important and worthwhile creative work. I love that. I love that you own that it's not comfortable. It reminds me of something our colleagues, um, Diego Rodriguez and Bob Sutton said in the early days, which was failure sucks, but instructs. <laughs> Yeah, like, there's an upside, but it hurts. Um, it really, it really hurts. And I think there's sort really of, hurts. you know, we have kind of almost like a glib celebration of failure, you know, sometimes. And yeah, it's let's like, talk it's about that. like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think if you don't do the part that's the end instructs, yeah. <laughs> like that, and well, first of all, that, that's, that part is really important. Right. And, and I think that the, 
the, you know, another great frame for that comes from Michael Deering around like composting your failures, right? It's like, actually you turn that right into mulch, but it, but you just, it's like, it, it doesn't feel good when you're, when you're experiencing that. And I think there's, um, you know, one of the things that became so clear to me as I was compiling this wide range of assignments from all of these different, you know, incredible uh, faculty and instructors at the D school is that we pay attention to emotions in a way that I think is not normal in an educational environment. As like, an academic, I can confirm not normal. Thank you. That's, <laughs> I feel, okay, we checked the box. An academic yeah. has actually confirmed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really, like, we design for it in a lot of ways. Yeah. And what's important is that we, we don't design out those moments of struggle or those experiences of failure. Mm -hmm right? We actually invite that in because that is what actually will prepare our students to be able to tackle redesigning how family members are involved in healthcare in, you know, in this part of India or redesigning, you know, how farmers are going to be able to irrigate their fields or working on substitute teaching like Jill Violet or working on redesigning the um, public benefits uh, at process in Michigan, like our, our alums who run Sevilla, um, which is an incredible social impact um, design firm. So like we want people to be, you know, prepared to tackle really hard challenges in complex environments with fat, you know, fast changing ecosystems. And so we got to invite that complexity into the, into the experience of taking a class of working on your very first design projects. And so then we have to deal with all the emotions that, that come out of that. Yeah. So I'm going to push a bit on this, um, the fail, the celebration of failure, because um, one of the things you you share in the book is the mantra of fail early, fail often. And I've been pushed um, on that phrase before. People have said, well, you know, it's really a privilege to be able to fail. Not everybody can fail. So I'm, I'd love to know where you where you stand on um, failing as a privilege in the creative practice. Yeah, I think I think it is a privilege and it's a space that I wish for more people to be able to experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of different ways to think about the scale of the failure that you're inviting into your work, right? So what we really want is for students to have the experience of not being so precious with their idea that they can't bear to put it out in any but the most polished form, because then you never have the experience then of um, either struggling and stretching or of actually genuinely inviting other people's feedback to help you improve that work. Yeah. The, the, the sort of mantra around, you know, like, like your, I mean, one of the things that I heard early on when I was sort of first encountering Silicon Valley was like, you know, uh, entrepreneurs who have had previous failures are more attractive to venture capitalists. And that, that's where I think you get into the real heart of like where privilege is tied up with that idea, right? It's like, oh, you, you, you had a failed company and now you're more attractive. Now you did, you probably do have a lot of really important skills that someone who's never failed has, but like that does kind of limit who might be an attractive investee for a VC if you're really valuing people who've had so much um, either financial cushion or whatnot to be able to have that level of failure, right? So like where I want to center the discussion on failure is in those lear early learning experiences where there it is very, it is much more, it, it's much less risky, right? And one, one thing that I have heard as feedback from, from some of my students is like the, it like allowing for putting out an unfinished prototype that you know is going to be, uh, not putting it out like shipping it but putting it out, like asking other people to give you feedback on it. Yeah. Um, that, is, that is also related to the topic of humility that you brought up, right? It's actually a way to say, I'm not assuming I know what the right answer is. I know it will be improved by other people look, weighing in, particularly the people who have actually experienced the thing that I'm trying to design for um, and design around. And that it, it, is, it is freeing. It frees the, the person of the, of the burden of trying to get it right the first time. Because if you're trying to get it right the first time, you are, you're gonna be more limited and you're gonna be more risk averse. So that's the space in the, in the creative yeah. process where I do want to be able to say, you know, okay, it's okay here to take some risks and to have these small failures and really to learn from them. Yeah. How does Great. that sit with you? How, I mean, how do you talk to your students about the same topic? I, I really like what you said in a similar way of this, like, what's the consequence of the failure, right? 
if, if you're going to lose your housing, if you're going to lose your access to food, that failing is not, um, is not an option really. But if, um, if really what you're going to do, for example, I had students um, share their PhD students share their research in class the other day, first, first moment, no, no practice, nothing. And the stakes felt so much higher. But once they did it, they realized, oh, okay, I actually got some good feedback and now I'm gonna make it better. Um, so the stakes were pretty low. I think we often perceive the stakes, especially those of us who are, are privileged is much greater than they are. And I think we have to be really sensitive to what the stakes are for many different, different people. What are the consequences? Yeah, in, I think that's right. Yeah, so very similar. Okay, so we're getting we're getting on to um, talking about feelings. Now I want to get to mental health. Um, anxiety and depression are on the rise. What is the relationship in your mind, especially because you've been in education now for fifteen years? How are you seeing um, the role of the work that you do, the creative work you with you do with the students influencing mental health for better or worse? Either way. Yeah, well, I hope for better. Um, we'd have to we'd have to do a full full study um, with our students. You know, I think you know one of the ways that um, I, I've been thinking about this is is related to the experience that we've just had for the past eighteen months, and particularly. And so we're now we're now starting to return to in person instruction on campus, and um, in the in the early stages of the pandemic when we were all adjusting to this the you know the new remote teaching and learning dynamic like there was um you know it was that was a really difficult experience for so many people i mean so many people regardless of like how old your kid was like just dealing with that was you know incredibly difficult and um i really noticed that in our classes where students were still like sticking with it and connecting with people who they were designing for and who they developed that, you know, some degree of empathy for, or, or like some understanding of like, oh, your needs are actually like potentially much more important than my needs as a frustrated, you know, college or grad student, that, that created actually a real sense of purpose that I think was incredibly useful for those students. And the name for that, I believe is pro-social motivation. Like, and it's, it's part of empathy. It's a little right? Adam Grant like, reference. Yes, he's a fan speaker. I love yes, that. right, right there. Like that's that's <laughs> I I I that's you know whose papers I I learned that framing from, and I I really believe that that's what was going on for those students is like they connected with someone they were and and then they had some agency right. Yeah. So like learning some of these behaviors and skills is like an amazing moment where you recognize I can make a difference, I can actually contribute something that's going to not maybe solve an intractable social problem, but actually improve the situation. I can bring some of my skills to bear. I can create an experience. I can create a product or service. And I think, and not only that, but like I can learn how to learn in this time of uncertainty, right? Like I can learn how to approach these kinds of challenges um, in a way that maybe I didn't realize that I, that I could. Right, because it's so it feels, especially for students who are, you know, this is like a significant percentage of their lives, like they just haven't had this this type of experience before. So, um, I I think that there are some really deep links between, you know, sort of like that that creative self efficacy, that that belief that you can make something that will actually improve things, yeah. that is that is really powerfully linked to to having that sense of purpose and that restoring some of that motivation. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, it's like competence combined with connection and yeah. some autonomy. I mean, I think what's interesting is the way you've presented the exercises in the book is not like you got to start with one and get through number 80. It's like pick and choose based on based on where where you are and what you need. I, I love to actually like like observe people as they're reading and like see what sequence they actually go in. That would be like, I'm so I'm so curious about that. So I felt really strongly in, in how I organized the book. So you're right, there's there's 80 assignments, right? They are, are kind of loosely organized, like as you might encounter them in a class on design, but you just don't have to go in that sequence. And um, 
there's there are like clusters. So if you're somebody who really wants to figure out like how do I do that thing that that new health team did, and I spot those opportunities that are kind of like hiding in plain sight, there's a whole section you know uh, for for you on those. If you're somebody who's like really looking to build new skills in collaboration, there's there's a whole section. But it, they're not rigid, right? <clears throat> Many of the assignments actually are cross listed, and I that's love how you they, do that. That they, they they're just like they're all too complicated to just put narrowly in one in one sort of rubric. And I think, you know, for me, I want everyone to have their own mental model of what their creative process looks like and, and how it works for them. And I don't really want like you to just sort of follow mine, like it's a recipe. And, and so that was part of like, I'm, I, I was actively trying to figure out how do I, how do I make sure that, you know, as the person who was lucky enough to be the curator and the writer and pull this whole collection together, that I'm not sort of like imposing my sense of like how creativity works on the reader, that you get to actually navigate this book for yourself. I love it. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with the question that's unfair to ask, but it's the, which one is your favorite? Um, but as you're thinking about that, I'm going to tell you about which one is today my favorite. Um, it was the, I think it's the Derive is the way it was Chrissa Carter's activity. And she instructs us to go out and to follow a specific quality in the environment. And she offers this as a way of getting unstuck, right? If you're stuck and let me, let me set the scene. I'm at the kids soccer game. It's like halftime. I'm <laughs> thinking really, is this my life? <laughs> I'm feeling a little stuck. So I took my 10 minutes and I followed, um, I saw this, these shaking trees and they were really active. And so I decided to follow activity. So I went from following these trees to then following this rambunctious dog that was having the time of his life rolling on the ground, then over to a body of water that was rippling down. And it was, um, honestly, the location was not very beautiful, but through this lens of activity, just following the activity lens, I was so, in, I was so delighted um, by the end. And it really made for a great halftime soccer, soccer, <laughs> halftime at soccer game. <laughs> I love that. So, the 10 minute to read. That's absolutely perfect. 10 minute um, to read. So is, what, yeah, yeah, that is also one of my, beautiful. that is one of my favorites. And actually, I think that's a good one for like in, in the mental health realm, like that just yeah. puts you into a state of flow, right? Like that totally actually really team. totally, yeah. you know, changes, I think probably your, I'm sure if we hooked you up to a machine, we would see like your brain waves Lots of things changing. Were going. Your, and then yeah, I went back and I found, I even watched the soccer game differently. It was like, instead of watching the position from the soccer ball, mm. I watched it in a different way. So that was mm. really fun. So what's your favorite before we turn it over to Lonnie for questions? I mean, I almost want to like, like go through it and like do a blind. Oh, you know, okay. what? I'll do it. I'll just do it. Okay. So, do that. Um, so one of my favorites um, <laughs> is uh, called practicing metaphors and um, metaphors are really powerful ways to kind of understand and assess like, what is this, what is this thing? What is this system like? Right. And it give, and a metaphor is so powerful because it's a it's a name that carries an emotion. So like okay. when you say it's raining cats and dogs, that's like all full of similes and metaphors. And like okay. there's a there's sort of, you know, some like emotion or I'm drowning in paperwork. Right. Like that carries that there's an emotional component there. So it's great in design because a metaphor allows you to then like project into the future what you want the emotional experience of this new uh -huh. thing that you're creating um, to be as well as the the idea so you essentially like look at different images that you feel like represent might best be a visual metaphor for the system that or the the thing that you're designing and okay. then you name all the different parts of it and it allows you to like expand your um, range of like all the different pieces of the system that could be redesigned or could be important or could you know you might have to actually incorporate into your solution. Okay, so that's can you one make of the that super that concrete for me? I'm getting it's a little abstract, but yes. I think the example that you give in the book is um, comparing something to a circus. So can we compare this conversation we're having to a circus, and would that illuminate new insights? Yes. Well, so clearly, uh, Lonnie is the, so the first thing we would do is we would name like, what, what is this, you know, situation? What are all the different pieces that are like, so yeah. we might say like, well, in a circus, there's a ringmaster, there's a clown, Lonnie. there's a, there's a crowd, there's a, there's food, there's a, an amazing sort of like combination of that popcorn smell and the peanuts, you know, it's like, Great. so then we would try to figure out like, what are all those different, what are all those different pieces? So, you know, we have an audience, we clearly have a ringmaster, 
um, I don't know. I feel a little bit like in the conversation, like we're, we're, we're the trapeze artists, right? So we are. You're, and- you're swinging out and you're asking <laughs> me to catch on to the, to the conversation. And then I'm, we're swinging back. Right. Yeah. So, and that. we're about to make a beautiful aerial dismount. We Let's end it right here like this. Aerial dismount. Done. Thank you, Sarah Stein Greenberg. That was a pleasure. I'm going to turn it over to Lonnie now, who is going to uh, ask you fabulous questions that are coming in from the audience. Lonnie, to you. It's better to be the ringmaster than the lion tamer. No taming required on this screen, that's for sure. Um, Thank you so much for just the liveliest. I got a couple texts from people saying, that Liz Gerber band. What, what wonderful facial expressions. <laughs> I grabbed a bunch of screenshots. I'll text I'll you guys. Tomorrow. Oh, thank you. That's great. Oh, it's great. I'm, I'm not, it's not embarrassing. It's good. Um, so a couple notes for everyone. Uh, we're going to ask a couple questions here from q and A. I want to remind you, uh, this is really just scratching the surface. I'm sure um, we've had some great questions in the Q&A. Mm-hmm. Click on that link that says buy a book in chat here. Go buy a book. You're going to get a receipt from the bookstall. There's going to be a link to register for after hours. Um, come have more fun. It's, it gets even more fun at after hours. You get to ask your own questions. You can chuckle. <laughs> it's, it's really great. So uh, with no further ado, let me ask a couple of these questions. Uh, I'm going to start with, hold on one second. I'm going to start with, we'll play, um, we'll play dealer's choice. What's the favorite question of the night is from Sanjeev. And they ask, hold on, let me slide over here. How would you approach brainstorming ideas about how to solve problems for an older generation? How would you go about familiarizing them with modern technology? Well, there's a really interesting question in there, which is, um, do older folks want modern technology? Like, what would that mean to them? What would that achieve for them? And so I think I, I always approach the, the process of brainstorming, like first from that perspective of curiosity of like, what, what else do I might like need to know about these people before I start framing up like what the ideas were, what, what, the, what the solutions might be to, to whatever it is. And um, I think, you know, I would, I, I would spend some time with some older folks. I would do some interviewing. I might do some observations. And then I'll tell you, there's a really powerful tool called a how might we statement. And how might we are kind of like the precursor to a good brainstorm where you take a bunch of different threads that you've noticed in your research where, you know, you've, you've had some, some new observations and, and new ideas. And um, you might say like, well, how, how might we help um, older folks experience new technology as an adventure? How might we help older folks use new technology to connect with their families or connect with younger people? And those would be built off kind of the hunches that you might have encountered throughout your research. Then you brainstorm around each and every one of those statements. So I think there's like a whole secret thing before brainstorming, which is like about breaking it apart in small ways and also naming these sort of unexpected different directions. And you will have a far more productive and successful brainstorm if you if you kind of do some of that pre-work right as you're leading into the, the actual ideation session. Excellent, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, question number two from Frankie, he or she asks, or they, could you elaborate more about inviting the struggles and failures when designing learning experiences? How might we use the learnings in our everyday life? <gasps> the answers are in this book. <laughs> <laughs> the answers are, and actually I'll just, I'll say, you know, one of the things that like made me so excited to be at the D school in the very early days, back when Liz and I were just first meeting, um, is that the, the early faculty use this approach called, I like, I wish how to, which is, which is one of the assignments that's in the book. And it was a way that they invited us as students to give feedback about each and every class session. And that is because this was a new model. This was a new institute. It was changing really fast. They wanted to kind of really iterate. So then as a student, you'd be giving feedback and then you'd see impact from your feedback from what hadn't worked so well in the very next class session. And so that was a way to just really bring that, you know, it's like as, as educators, we have a struggle. We don't always know that what we're teaching is actually what people are learning. But you can ask them and you can ask and invite students to be part of that constructive process of making something better. All right, good. I like this question. Uh, timely for a lot of folks from Molly. She says, any insights for those of us designing for a return to hybrid work environment? Best practices for creating spaces for others to collaborate and be creative. 
Yeah. I mean, I think we, we are, we are faced with like a whole new set of challenges. The only thing I'll say is like, we haven't fully figured out hybrid, but we are going to, and I know that we are going to, because we did figure out distributed ex- collaboration. Right. And, and so for example, like when we were all fully distributed as a, as a group at the D school, we just really missed spontaneity. And we so badly wanted that experience of like walking by someone unexpected in the hall and having that hallway conversation. And so we figured out how do we design spontaneity into our weekly staff meeting, right? We have a 10 minute breakout room that's randomly you know, assigned by Zoom and that's how we've been doing it. Now that we're gonna be doing more hybrid work, we gotta figure out some new ways, but that need for spontaneity is, has not gone away. We're just gonna to have to design for it differently. So I would say my, my most important advice is just think about what are, the, what are the human experiences that you want people who are returning in this environment to be having? What are the human experiences that we're all bringing to that, right? In terms of the, the, the really challenging times that we've just been through and how do you actually mindfully design for that in the new interactions, the new rituals, and also whatever technology you're using to support that. And the, the last thing I'll say on that is, I think we often lead with like, ooh, what's the cool piece of technology that's gonna let us do blah, blah, blah. And instead, if you let the technology be the thing that you do at the, at the end of your process, what are the needs of the people? What's the experience you wanna create? And what technology will support that? That puts technology kind of at the right moment in your, in your creative process. Um, in case anyone else is like me, and maybe you talked about it in the webinar, and I was busy with something, so I didn't catch it in the webinar, but I got my wheel spun a little bit when you said distributed environments. Can yeah, so I, I yeah, I'm happy to. Who just I, I, reckon, I recognize that that's like a, a new piece of jargon for a lot of people. So um, I think when we first transitioned uh, to online, a lot of people were talking about remote, remote learning, remote collaboration. And one of my colleagues, Glenn Fajardo said, it's not remote, it's distributed. Remote is when there's a center and everyone else is separate from that center. And actually we are completely level. We're all having the same experience together. And so now, even if some of us are physically back on Stanford's campus and some of us are, are still at a distance, we are still actually calling it distributed environments, distributed distributed collaboration, distributed learning, because again, it's breaking down that sort of implicit idea that you're not at the center of things if you're, if you're online. And we just, we got to get over that. That's like the new way in which we're, we're all, we're all working these days. And just, just to build on that quickly, Sarah, um, organizational scholars have been studying distributed work for a long time, but it was almost by choice at that point. Um, and so it's been really fun watching a lot of their research come into action and people now saying, oh, wait, this is this is a thing. And how do we use technology, in fact, to enable it? All right. I want to get to uh, Mani's question. Um, he or she uh, or they submitted a question also in advance on their registration form and they're here now. So I want to this is an important question. So I want to jump in and get it. How do we get our colleagues and work team to buy into the idea of doing a design thinking exercise? force cash usually work. Um, I have no influence with my team. I have no, and now here's the crux. I have no influence with my team being a new member, but we have some process improvements needed. I can imagine a cross-functional exercise or workshop together uh, would result in some innovative solutions. So here's somebody, a newbie in the environment, wants to kind of chomp in a little bit, what you got for them? Yeah, I have two specific ideas. Yeah, this is a really important question. So I'm so glad that it came up. So there's there's two things I'll say. One is you yourself can model a kind of creative behavior that will attract other people to you. It won't attract everyone, but it will attract others. And then you're going to find out who your allies are and who might be kind of like a little bit more like-minded. Very concrete example. Early in my career, I was working at a consulting firm. I was like wearing a suit every day. I was really, I was like working in New York. I was, I was trying to be all polished. And I just started using the whiteboard in my office to storyboard my, my slide decks before I actually built them in a digital format. It was so much faster. And a partner at the firm walked by one day and he just said, well, that's what whiteboards should be used for. And I got this, like, I had felt almost like I needed to hide it. And then he, ju- he, he like completely legitimized that like this was a, an admirable quality. So the first thing I'd say is like, just show your own creative process, maybe a little bit, let your log book, your notebook fall open and see people, you know, <laughs> let people see how you sketch or let people see how you write, just, you know, by accident. So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing I'll say is like, 
you don't always have to move your, your team as the first mover, right? So when you find your, your allies, your co-conspirators, run a short design sprint with those folks just for an hour or two and see what kind of ideas can come out that builds your own skills as a facilitator and how you introduce these to other people. And also it gives you something tangible to go to maybe your manager and say, you know, or, or your, you know, wh whoever you're trying to convince and say like, Hey, I tried this and actually some really good ideas came out. Could we try this with the whole team? Oh, love it. Love it. Love all that. All right. We're creeping up on eight o'clock. It is eight o'clock. I'm going to close this out with um, a comment from uh, a favorite, I know certainly of Liz and likely of Sarah as well from Patricia Ryan Madsen, who says, I want to thank you for adding the reference names to each exercise. It makes our world of problem solving and creativity into a huge community of teachers and resources. I've never seen a book that did this. I am reading a chapter each night before sleep. Thanks for making this work and play available to the world. Brava. Yes. Thank that's you. I'm being here without you, Patricia. Thank you. Ditto, ditto, and ditto. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. 